So last time we were uh, when we were reading the Hunger Games, a few things happened. Let's see where we are. So we're in chapter ten, right? Chapter nine. So chapter ten, right before the page, actually literally says the game, right? So we've been reading about what happens before the game. So a quick synopsis uh, of what happened. So Katniss lives in in uh, District Twelve. She has a uh, companion named Gail, sister named Primrose. And uh, mom, dad died already, right? Some basic information, right? And uh, she got chosen for the game. And uh, along with a boy that she knew up of, but not not very well, called Peter Mallard, right? And all of a sudden, after saying goodbye to her mom and also her sister and Gail, she's on the train to the capital. Okay, and then she got dressed up in 15 different ways, right, uh, before joining the game. And she sees a lot of things that she's never seen before and uh, gets interviewed and then uh, showed off her, her skills uh, using the bow and arrow and got a, uh, a 11 out of 12 score for her, uh, for her skills, right, for her skill, uh, for her combat skill so and then Pita said uh, to Haymitch who actually was the former winner of the Hunger Game okay um, said that uh, he wants to be trained alone right that was, so that was actually the end of the the first part right so then this, and also let me see here okay Oh yeah, and also Pita said to the uh, to the interviewer, which is na his name is Caesar, right? Caesar said that uh, he secretly liked Canis. So there's a possibility that Pita is actually making that up, right? Uh, as a strategy, we don't know yet because the story stopped there. So we can continue reading and see whether or not Pita actually told the truth about the fact that she liked. Katniss or not, right? So we can actually find out, okay, a little bit more from the story. I'm continuing reading the story, okay? So let's take a look at the story here. Uh, let me search up um, Hunger Games so I can have the reader read it. Hunger Games, Chapter 10. By the way, the second book is actually not called Hunger Games. Do you guys actually know what the second book is called, by the way? Has anyone heard of the second book? Okay. The second book is actually called uh, Catching Fire. The second movie is called Hunger Games, colon, Catching Fire, right? But the, but the second book is called Catching Fire. And the third book is called, ready? Called Mocking Jay. Wait, what did you say the third book is? Something Fire? Jerry? No, Mocking Jay. It's a bird. Yeah. Okay, it's a bird. Okay. It's a bird. So since you don't actually, uh, you're not going to actually watch the actual, uh, well, you're not going to read Catching Fire. It was very interesting because on the weekend, um, I actually watched the second movie. So there was another interview, actually. Okay, in the second movie. I watched the entire trilogy, quadrilogy, by the way. <laughs> I watched it. So I want to show you the second movie here. Okay. Sam Collins, Chapter 10. For a moment, the cameras hold on Peter's downcast eyes. That's what he said, Saint Sin. Then I complete my face, mouth half open, in a mix of surprise and protest, magnified on every screen as I realize me. He means me. I press my lips together and stare at the Yeah, so, so at the first movie's interview, right, Peter said, 
there's a girl that I like, right, in my district. So, so Caesar said, well, you can win the game and go back and ask her, right? And then Peter said, well, there's no use in my case because she came with me into the, into the game, right? So that means that uh, Peter said that he likes uh, Kenneth, right? That's actually what he told everybody who's watching the interview, right? So that's it. That's a big news. But And then Kenneth is like, what the heck? What did you say, right? So so Kenneth said, well, I didn't, I, I didn't agree to anyone, like, any of that, right? Anyways, okay. Hoping this will conceal their emotions starting to boil up inside of me. Oh, that is a piece of bad luck, said Caesar. There's a real edge of pain in his voice. The crowd is murmuring in agreement. A few have even given agonized cries. It's not good, agrees Peter. Well, I don't think any of us can blame you. It'd be hard not to fall for that young lady, says Caesar. She didn't know? Peter shakes his head. Not until now. I allow my eyes to flicker up to the screen long enough to see that the blush on my cheeks is unmistakable. Wouldn't you love to pull her back out here and get a response? Caesar asks the audience. The crowd screams assent. Sadly, rules are rules, and Katniss Everdeen's time has been spent. Well, best of luck to you, Peter Malark, and I think I speak for all of Pan Am when I say our hearts go with yours. The roar of the crowd is deafening. Peter has absolutely wiped the rest of us off the map with his declaration of love for me. When the audience finally settles down, he chokes out a quiet thank you and returns to his seat. We stand for the anthem. I have to raise my head out of the required respect and cannot avoid seeing that every screen is now dominated by a shot of Peter and me, separated by a few feet that in the viewer's head can never be breached. Poor, tragic us. But I know better. After the anthem, the tributes file back into the training center lobby and onto the elevators. I make sure to veer into a car that does not contain PETA. The crowd slows our entourages of stylists and mentors. And oh, by the way, when you see a car, uh, the the box inside the elevator, okay, that you ride in an elevator, it's called a car, by the way, okay? Okay? So you enter the elevator and you press buttons, okay? The box is called the car. Okay, C A R. Okay, car. So you will see sometimes in the elevator, it will say max car capacity. Okay. And also, when you ride a train, right? You know, the train is um, piece by piece, right? One piece of train is called a car as well, C A R. Okay. Not just the thing that you drive. Okay. Okay. Friends, so we have only each other for company. No one speaks. My elevator stops to deposit four tributes before I am alone and then find the doors opening on the 12th floor. Peter has only just stepped from his car when I slam my palms into his chest. He loses his balance and crashes into an ugly urn filled with fake flowers. The urn tips and shatters into hundreds of tiny pieces. Peter lands in the shards and blood immediately flows from his hands. Okay, an urn is like a vase. Vase is V A S E. It's not called vase. It's some people, like some British people, might say it's called vase, but 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 I hear vase as well. V V A S E. Okay, it's a thing that you put a uh, put a bunch of flour into. Okay, so va vase. Okay, vase or vase. Okay, vase vase. Okay, continuing. What was that for? He says, aghast. You had no right, no right to go saying those things about me. I shout at him. Now the elevator's open and the whole crew is there. Effie, Hamish, Cinna, and Portia. What's going on? Says Effie, a note of hysteria in her voice. Did you fall? After she shoved me, says Peter, as Effie and Cinna help him up. Hamish turns on me. Shoved him? This was your idea, wasn't it? Turning me into some kind of fool in front of the entire country, I answer. It was my idea, says Peter, wincing as he pulls spikes of pottery from his palms. Hamish just helped me with it. Yes, Hamish is very helpful. To you, I say. You are a fool, Hamish says in disgust. Do you think he hurt you? That boy just gave you something you can never achieve on your own. He made me look weak, I say. He made you look desirable. And let's face it. Yeah, so this, this actually came up in a movie, by the way. It made me look weak. He made you look desirable. Okay. Maybe I can show you a video. Of it. So the details are different, but 
overall the idea the story is similar right you can use all the help you can get in that department you were about as romantic as goat until he said he wanted you now they all do you're all they're talking about the star-crossed lovers from district 12 says hamish see but we're not star-crossed lovers i say hamish grabs my shoulders and pins me against the wall who cares it's all a big show it's all how you're perceived the most I all right, it's all a big show, and in the uh, movie, Hamish said it's a television show, right? Hamish is like, come on, why are you fighting? It's a show, it's not real, okay? Focus on winning the game, come on, stop fighting stupid things, right? That's, that's what Hamish's attitude is, right? say about you after your interview was that you were nice enough although that in itself was a small miracle now i can say you're a heartbreaker oh 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 how the boys back home fall longingly at your feet which do you think will get you more sponsors the smell of wine on his breath makes me sick i shove his hands off my shoulders and step away trying to clear my head Cinna comes over and puts his arm around me he's right katniss i don't know what to think I should have been told, so I didn't look so stupid. No, your reaction was perfect. If you'd known, it wouldn't have read as real, says Portia. She's just worried about her boyfriend, says Peter, roughly, tossing away a bloody... Right? So so they said, yeah, that was perfect, because... And, and then and then, uh, then Kenny said, someone should have told me, right? Then then uh, I, I would look so stupid, right? And But, but it, it makes sense, because if she knew... Then it wouldn't look so real, right? Now it looks really real, right? The reaction is very genuine, right? Genuine. G-E-N-U-I-N-E. -E, genuine. Real. Authentic, right? Authentic reaction reaction, right? These are okay. Yeah, these are synonyms of the word real, right? Real. Okay. All right. But guess what? It's an oxymoron because nothing nothing is actually quite real in this in this show or this this uh, t television show right uh, hunger of hunger games right not not much is actually real okay so continue my cheeks burn again at the thought of Gail I don't have a boyfriend whatever says Peter but I bet he's smart enough to know a bluff when he sees it. Besides, you didn't say you love me. So what does it matter? The words are sinking in, my anger fading. I'm torn now between thinking I've been used and thinking I've been given an edge. Hamish is right. I survived my interview, but what was I really? A silly girl spinning in a sparkling dress, giggling. The only moment of any substance I had was when I talked about Prim. Compare that with Thresh, his silent, deadly power, and unforgettable. Silly and sparkly and forgettable. No, not entirely forgettable. I have my 11 in training. But now Peter has made me an object of love, not just his. To hear him tell it, I have many admirers. And if the audience really thinks we're in love, I remember how strongly they responded to his confession. Star-crossed lovers. Hamish is right. They eat right, so the only comparison I can give you is Guys, remember uh, in China, there's a uh, very famous model slash uh, celebrity called Fan Bing Bing, right? Remember her? Oh, right. So before she's like cool, you know, she's very unapproachable, right? Unapproachable, right? Okay. Unappro uh, sorry, that is a mistake in there. Unapproachable, A, hey, right there. Yeah, unapproachable. But then, but then the moment she said, oh, I have a boyfriend, all of a sudden, she's a family girl, right? People started liking her a little bit more, right? That's the idea, okay? <laughs> okay, before she's just good looking, right? Right now, she's actually like, she's actually approachable, right? So that that's the difference, okay? All okay. right. Yeah, being good looking and likable is different from being desirable, right? People actually want you now, right? <laughs> It's a little bit different, right? Get stuff up in the capital. Suddenly I'm worried that I didn't react properly. After you said he loved me, did you think I could be in love with him too? I asked. I did, says Portia. 
the way you avoided looking at the cameras, the blush, the others chime in agreeing, you're golden, sweetheart. You're going to have sponsors lined up around the block, says Hamish. I'm embarrassed about my reaction. I force myself to acknowledge Peta. I'm sorry I shoved you. It doesn't matter. He shrugs. Although it's technically illegal. Are your hands okay? I ask. Yeah, Oop. because it's illegal for for tributes to fight each other before the game, right? By the way, okay. And you can see in a movie, it's even more dramatic, right? Elbow against the throat, right? And the, against the wall, right? Okay. So that, that was even stronger reaction, right, in, in the movie, right? Which is called dramatization, right? To actually make it more dramatic, right? Boom, boom, right? All the, all the fire. Anyways. Anyways, continue. Uh, okay. We are right, he says. In the silence that follows, delicious smells of our dinner waft in from the dining room. Come on, let's eat, says Hamage. We all follow him to the table and take our places. But then Peta is bleeding too heavily, and Portia leads him off for medical treatment. We start the cream and rose petal soup without them. By the time we finish, they're back. Peta's hands are wrapped in bandages. I can't help feeling guilty. Tomorrow, we will be in the arena. He has done me a favor, and I have answered with an injury. Will I never stop owing him? After dinner, we watch the replay in the sitting room. I seem frilly and shallow, twirling and giggling in my dress, although the others assure me I am charming. Peta actually is charming, and then utterly winning as a boy in love. And there I am, blushing and competing. So, so uh, Peta is actually known to be the boy in love, okay? That's really, that really stands out because nobody in all this 12 districts say, oh, we, like, we love each other, right? So love is actually a theme in this, in, in this, uh, in this, right? And uh, in this book. And also punishment, oh no, uh, brutality, brutal, inter brutality, and uh, as entertainment, right? Brutality as entertainment. Or violence as entertainment, right? Okay, and this right now is love as entertainment, right? Okay. So you can say brutality, violence, and love as entertainment, right? As forms of entertainment. Um, people just watch anything, okay? As long as it's, is, uh, how do I say? It triggers the sense of curiosity and also uh, the, the desire to consume, consume information. It triggers people to want to know about things and want to pay money and invest the time and money into these things, right? Into other people's affairs. And that's actually what the book tries to tries to say uh, as well, okay? So you, you laugh at these people, but when you're laughing at them, you're thinking, hmm, am I doing that too? Am I these people? Am I paying a lot of money to, to buy a book? Okay, before the internet, right? People have to pay for magazine, pay magazine, pay for magazines to read who Fan Big Bang is dating last week, you know, and all the pictures, you know, they take, okay, and things like things like that. People have to pay money for that, right? And people are still spending a lot of time to talk about all these movie stars and things like that, right? So, so, um, so now you're laughing at them. And it's like, ha ha ha! These people are so stupid, right? They just want to know about the love story of of Pita and also. Uh, and also Katniss, right? But it's a, a good it's a good time for us to think about, hmm, am I nosy like these people? Okay, should I reflect on myself and think about myself as well, right? So that's a, that's a good time to also think about that, okay? Cool. And uh, that's why reading is good because it allows you to reflect on yourself, right? To think about yourself, okay? Okay, continue. Made beautiful by Sinna's hands, desirable by Peter's confession, tragic by circumstance, and by all accounts, unforgettable. Yeah, sorry. So Peter is known to be the boy in love, right? And uh, and uh, Katniss is actually known to be the girl on fire. 
So now they are all memorable, right? People rem people remember them, right? They, there's a thing that they re they remember them by, and that is the most important thing because because now if people remember you, what happened, guys? If people remember you, what happens? No, literally just happened in the vi movie, in the video, and also in the book. What happened? Why, why do we, do they have to make themselves memorable, guys? Come on. No, come on. It's in the in the movie too. Come on, guys. No, 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 no. What is it? Jerry? You know why? Why do they have to make themselves memorable? Why why do they need to make people remember them? No. Oh no. <laughs> you guys don't understand, eh? You guys don't understand some of the stuff, eh? What happened? Oh no, you guys don't understand. No, nobody knows? No. What's the point of making themselves memorable? Nobody knows? Oh no. I wish one of you actually knows about know about it. Any, do you know why? They they want to make people remember them? You don't know either? I wish one of you know about it. It will make me very happy. Slightly happier. No? Oh no, you guys don't know, eh? You guys don't know. It's because they want to get sponsors, which may save your life. Let me just play the video again. If you guys weren't, weren't paying attention or didn't know what the video talked about. Okay, continue. When the anthem finishes and the screen goes dark, a hush falls on the room. Tomorrow at dawn, we will be roused and prepared for the arena. The actual games don't start until 10 because so many of the capital residents rise late. But Pita and I must make an early start. There is no telling how far we will travel to the arena that has been prepared for this year's games. I know Hamish and Effie will not be going with us. As soon as they leave here, they'll be at the game's headquarters, hopefully madly signing up our sponsors, working out a strategy on how and when to deliver the gifts to us. Senate and Portia will travel with us to the very spot from which we will be launched into the arena. Still, final goodbyes must be said here. Effie takes both of us by the hand, and with actual tears in her eyes, wishes as well. Thanks us for being the best tributes it has ever been her privilege to sponsor. And then, because it's Effie, and she's apparently required by law to say something awful, she adds, I wouldn't be at all surprised if I finally get promoted to a decent district next year. Then, she kisses each of us on the cheek and hurries out, overcome with either the emotional parting or the possible improvement of her fortunes. Hamish crosses his arms and looks us both over. Any final words of advice, asks Peter? When the gong sounds, get the hell out of there. You're neither of you up to the bloodbath at the cornucopia. Just clear out. Put as much to... So cornucopia is... Uh, so at the beginning of the game, um, it's all where all the weapons and, and things are in the middle. Okay, That's called a cornucopia, by the way. Okay. So, uh, so what Hamish said is, um, when you actually begin the game, run away from the cornucopia. Don't actually go and fight people and get whatever in the middle. Okay, let me show you. The girl who was on fire. 
Perhaps it will give me something to hold on to in the days to come. I pull on a thick, fleecy nightgown and climb into bed. It takes me about five seconds to realize I'll never fall asleep. And I need sleep desperately because in the arena, every moment I give into fatigue will be an invitation to death. It's no good. One hour, two, three pass. My eyelids refuse to get heavy. I can't stop trying to imagine it. See, yesterday I mentioned to you the, about the word fatigue, right? It's tired, right? Yeah, appears in the book. All right. Exactly what terrain I'll be thrown into. Desert, swamp, a frigid wasteland. Above all, I'm hoping for trees, which may afford me some means of concealment and food and shelter. Often, there are trees because barren landscapes are dull and the games resolve too quickly without them. But what will the climate be like? What traps have the game makers hidden to liven up the slower moments? And then there are my fellow tributes. The more anxious I am to find sleep, the more it eludes me. Finally, I am too restless to even stay in bed. I pace the floor, heart beating too fast, breathing too short. My room feels like a prison cell. If I don't get air soon, I'm going to start to throw things again. I run down the hall to the door to the roof. It's not only unlocked, but ajar. Perhaps someone forgot to close it, but it doesn't matter. The energy field in closing the roof forbids any desperate form of escape. And I'm not looking to escape, only to fill my lungs with air. I want to see the sky and the moon on the last night that no one will be hunting me. The roof is not lit at night, but as soon as my bare feet reach its tiled surface, I see his silhouette black against the light that shines endlessly in the capital. There's quite a commotion going on down in the streets, music and singing and car horns, none of which I could hear through the thick glass window panels in my room. I could slip away now without him noticing me. He wouldn't hear me over the din. But the night's air is so sweet, I can't bear returning to that stuffy cage of a room. And what difference does it make, whether we speak or not? My feet move soundlessly across the tiles. I'm only a yard behind him when I say, you should be getting some sleep. He starts, but doesn't turn. I can see him give his head a slight shake. I didn't want to miss the party. It's for us, after all. I come up beside him and lean over the edge of the rail. The wide streets are full of dancing people. I squint to make out their tiny figures in more detail. Are they in costumes? Who could tell, Peter answers, with all the crazy clothes they wear here. Couldn't sleep either? Couldn't turn my mind off, I say. Thinking about your family, he asks. No, I admit, a bit guiltily. All I can do is wonder about tomorrow, which is pointless, of course. In the light from below, I can see his face now, the awkward way he holds his bandaged hands. I really am sorry about your hands. It doesn't matter, Katniss, he says. I've never been a contender in these games anyway. That's no way to be thinking, I say. Why not? It's true. My best hope is to not disgrace myself, and he hesitates. And what, I say. I don't know how to say it exactly, only... I want to die as myself. Does that make any sense? He asks. I shake my head. How could he die as anyone but himself? I don't want them to change me in there, turn me into some kind of monster that I'm not. I bite my lip, feeling inferior. While I've been ruminating on the availability of trees, Peter has been struggling with how to maintain his identity, his purity of self. Do you mean you won't kill anyone? I ask. No. When the time comes, I'm sure I'll kill just like everybody else. I can't go down without a fight. Only I keep wishing I could think of a way to to show the capital they don't own me. Then I'm more than just a piece in their games, says Peta. But you're not, I say. None of us are. That's how the games work. Okay, but within the framework, there's still you. There's still me, he insists. Don't you see? So there's a there's a um, metaphor saying that we are just... Well, I am just a pawn in the game. So it's talking about international, well, it's talking about chess, right? C-H-E-S-S, -S, chess, right? A pawn is the smallest piece, right? In the, in the game, okay? A pawn is moved by the player, right? You don't get to make decision, right? Pieces in the game. You move the game pieces, right? But the game pieces themselves, they don't actually get to make any decisions. 
So that's what Peter is saying is that we're in a game. Although we can do whatever in the whatever we want in the game, right? We don't have control over our own lives because in the end, um, in the end, the rules are not set by us, right? The rule says we have to kill everybody in order to win the game, right? And that's the decision that is made for us. Okay. Okay. Only, no offense, but who cares, PETA? I say. I do. I mean, what else am I allowed to care about at this point? He asked angrily. He's locked those blue eyes on mine now, demanding an answer. I take a step back. Care about what Hamish said about staying alive. PETA smiles at me, sad and mocking. Okay. Thanks for the tip, sweetheart. It's like a slap in the face, his use of Hamish's patronizing endearment. Look. If you want to spend the last hours of your life planning some noble death in the arena, that's your choice. I want to spend mine in District 12. Wouldn't surprise me if you do, says Peta. Give my mother my best when you make it back, will you? Count on it, I say. Then I turn and leave the roof. I spend the rest of the night slipping in and out of those, imagining the cutting remarks I will make to Peta Malark in the morning. Peta Malark. We will see how high and mighty he is when he's faced with life and death. He'll probably turn into one of those raging beast tributes, the kind who tries to eat someone's heart after they've killed them. There was a guy like that a few years ago from District 6 called Titus. He went completely savage, and the game makers had to have him stunned with electric guns to collect the bodies of the players he'd killed before he ate them. There are no rules in the arena, but cannibalism doesn't play well with the capital audience, so they tried to head it off. There was some speculation that the avalanche that finally took Titus out was specifically engineered to ensure the victor was not a lunatic. I don't see Pita in the morning. Sina comes to me before dawn, gives me a simple shift to wear, and guides me to the roof. My final dressing and preparations will be done in the catacombs under the arena. A hovercraft appears out of thin air, just like the one did in the woods that day I saw the red-headed Abox girl captured, and a ladder drops down. I place my hands and feet on the lower rungs, and instantly, it's as if I'm frozen. Some sort of current glues me to the ladder while I'm lifted safely inside. I expect the ladder to release me then, but I'm still stuck when a woman in a white coat approaches me carrying a syringe. This is just your tracker, Katniss. The stiller you are, the more efficiently I can place it, she says. Still? So there's a tracker that they inject into your body to see where you are, like a GPS, right? I'm a statue, but that doesn't prevent me from feeling the sharp stab of pain as the needle inserts the metal tracking device deep under the skin of the inside of my forearm. Now the game makers will always be able to trace my whereabouts in the arena. They don't want to lose a tribute. As soon as the tr tracker is in place, the ladder releases me. The woman disappears and Senate is retrieved from the roof. An Avox boy comes in and directs us to a room where breakfast has been laid out. Despite the tension in my stomach, I eat as much as I can although none of the delectable food makes any impression on me. I'm so nervous I could be eating coal dust. The one thing that distracts me at all is the view from the windows as we sail over the city and then to the wilderness beyond. This is what birds see, only they're free and safe, the very opposite of me. The ride lasts about half an hour before the windows black out, suggesting that we're nearing the arena. The hovercraft lands and Senna and I go back to the ladder, only this time it leads down into a tube underground, into the catacombs that lie beneath the arena. We follow instructions to my destination, a chamber for my prep. Catacomb is like a maze. M-A-Z-E. Right? It's a place with different roads underground, different branches of roads underground. Okay? Like a maze. Okay. In the capital, they call it the launch room. In the districts... It's referred to as a stockyard, the place animals go for slaughter. Everything is brand new. I will be the first and only tribute to use this launch room. The arenas are historic sites preserved after the games. Popular destinations for capital residents to visit, to vacation. Go for a month, rewatch the games, tour the catacombs, visit the sites where the deaths took place. You can even take part in reenactments. They say the food is excellent. I struggle to keep my breakfast down as I shower and clean my teeth. Yeah, so the game, 
arenas are actually made new every single year, right? They're made new. So the old places, the old game locations are actually used as uh, as um, as a place for people to visit, right? Just like if you go to like the the Forbidden City in Beijing, right? <laughs> okay, uh, let me see here. Um, so um, in in Toronto, there's a place called Medieval Times. So when you come back to Toronto, guys, you can go to Medieval Times, okay, and you can watch watch the, uh, the show while eating in there. You can be, you can eat. There's food for you on the on the side here when you're eating, okay. Oh, and the food it's also served in also historic like um, uh, uh, containers and also silverware as well like that. Okay, damn, I should bring my girlfriend there one day. Okay, you should go there. It's called Medieval Time, by the way. Okay. Now let's continue. Cinna does my hair in my simple trademark braid down my back. Then the clothes arrive. The same for every tribute. Cinna has had no say in my outfit, does not even know what will be in the package, but he helps me dress in the undergarments, simple tawny pants, light green blouse, sturdy brown belt, and thin hooded black jacket that falls to my thighs. The material in the jacket is designed to reflect body heat. Expect some cool nights, he says. The boots, worn over skin-tight socks, are better than I could have hoped for. Soft leather, not unlike my ones at home. These have a narrow, flexible rubber sole with threads, though. Good for running. I think I'm finished when Senna pulls the gold Mockingjay pin from his pocket. I had completely forgotten about it. Where did you get that? I ask. Off the green outfit you wore on the train, he says. I remember now taking off my mother's dress, pinning it to the shirt. It's your district token, right? I nod. He fastens it onto my shirt. Okay, so so you they are not supposed to actually wear these, by the way, mocking Jay or whatever into the game. But Sina secretly put it on to uh, to Candice. Okay, it's against the rule. Okay, but it's so small that they might not be able to see it. Okay, so. It barely cleared the review board. Some thought the pen could be used as a weapon, giving you an unfair advantage. But eventually, they let it through. Oh. Oh, 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 okay. So there was a review board, I guess. Okay, in the movie, in the movie, Cinna actually uh, sneaked it to um, to Candace. But I guess in the uh, in the actual in the book, um, he had to go through review, right? So somebody had to say yes, you can wear this before uh, before they are they allowed to wear that for the for the game, right? So that that was uh, that was interesting. I didn't know about that actually. Okay, continue. They eliminated a ring from the district one girl though. If he twisted the gemstone, a spike popped out, poisoned one. She claimed she had no knowledge the ring Ooh. transformed, and there was no way to prove she did. But she lost her token. There, you're all set. Move around. Make sure everything feels comfortable. I walk, run in a circle, swing my arms about. Yes. It's fine. Fits perfectly. Then there's nothing to do but wait for the call, says Senna. Unless you think you can eat anymore. I turn down food, but accept a glass of water that I take tiny sips of as we wait on a couch. I don't want to chew on my nails or lips, so I find myself gnawing on the inside of my cheek. It still hasn't fully healed from a few days ago. Soon the taste of blood fills my mouth. Nervousness seeps into terror as I anticipate what is to come. I could be dead. Flat out dead in an hour, not even. My fingers obsessively trace the hard little lump on my forearm where the women injected the tracking device. I press on it, even though it hurts. I press on it so hard a small bruise begins to form. Do you want to talk, Katniss? Senna asks. I shake my head, but after a moment, hold out my hand to him. Senna encloses it in both of his. And this is how we sit until a pleasant female voice announces it's time to prepare for lunch. Still clenching one of Sinna's hands, I walk over and stand on the circular metal plate. Remember what Hamish said, run, find water, the rest will follow, he says. I nod, and remember this, 
I'm not allowed to bet, but if I could, my money would be on you. Truly, I whisper. Truly, says Senna. He yeah. runs down. He said that in the movie too. I'm not allowed to bet, but if I have to bet, my money would be on you. Kisses me on the forehead. Good luck, girl on fire. And then a glass cylinder is lowering around me, breaking our handhold, cutting him off from me. He taps his fingers under his chin, head high. I lift my chin and stand as straight as I can. The cylinder begins to rise. For maybe 15 seconds, I'm in darkness, and then I can feel the metal plate pushing me out of the cylinder into the open air. For a moment, my eyes are dazzled by the bright sunlight, and I'm conscious only of a strong wind with a hopeful smell of pine trees. Then I hear the legendary announcer, Claudius Templesmith, as his voice booms all around me. Ladies and gentlemen, let the 74th Hunger Games begin. Okay, so the game began. And uh, maybe I can also show you the video of uh, how she said goodbye to Sina as well. But they didn't have a couch. I don't remember in the movie, the couch. Sina, goodbye, Hunger Games. Right? So okay, yep, I can. I found it actually. Uh, yeah, it's a really bad clip, but I can show it to you. Yes. Boom, boom. Wait, Sina's death? No, 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 no. No, not this one. <laughs> 